Welcome to the New Voices of Influence, a survey of emerging digital HCP opinion leaders produced by LiveWorld, a leader in HCP digital and social marketing. I'm Umar Siddiqui, Chief Medical Officer for LiveWorld. Today, our guest is Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson, MD, Chief Medical Officer at Spoonful One. She's a pediatrician, author, and prominent advocate of evidence-based medicine and prevention. For 10 years, Dr. Swanson wrote the Seattle Mama Doc blog for Seattle Children's Hospital, and in 2013, she founded the Digital Health Department. Dr. Swanson was the Chief of Digital Innovation for six years, leading an innovation team testing and creating new digital tools. Welcome, Wendy. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. So we'll dive right in. Uh, can you share a little bit about your medical background? I was a teacher before I went to medical school, so always very invested in education in that space. And when I did my medical degree, I also received a master's degree in bioethics, um, which has laid the foundation for me at trying to think on how we practice medicine and use new technology of this time to meet patients and families, of course, where they are. I then uh, completed my pediatric residency at University of Washington at Seattle Children's Hospital, and then practiced primary care pediatrics full-time for three years before I started the Seattle Mama Doc blog, which was the first blog um, here in the United States for a hospital system. And then since then have really evolved my career in some ways, both continuing to practice medicine for 12 years and then gradually moving into more of the health translation technology uh, startup um, and, and global space. And I'm now, as, as you know, the chief medical officer at a startup, a venture-backed startup in Silicon Valley, working to protect and prevent food allergies in children. Wow, what an eventful journey and everything. So uh, what was the catalyst for you to start your blog and your digital activities? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think a couple of forces were at play. Um, when I was pregnant with my second son in 2008, I got stuck on bed rest after 30 weeks gestation. And I'm not one to like sitting around. I mean, I became a little bit more meditative. <laughs> um, but two things were happening at that time. You know, Facebook would, had moved into the public sector. So it had left the university setting and moved into the public sector. And, you know, it was the Obama uh, election time. So I ended up becoming extremely glued. I was an early user on Facebook because a friend of mine's sister had been at Harvard and had been using it as a student and started using Facebook. And truly kind of this gestalt went on that was like, wait a second, like, not only can can we use digital or excuse me, use traditional media to kind of get the word out on health, um, we can listen in that same place. So it was just using it personally and being stuck on bed rest and looking even at the political landscape of, of what was happening with ideas and idea sharing. So when after my second son was born and I went back into practice, I approached Seattle Children's and said, you know, I think you need a blog. Like I think if you want to think about how to change the population and truly embody the mission of the hospital, which was prevent, care, and cure, that part of the way that we need to do that is to help parents have access to, you know, scientific-minded, appealing, and relatable information. And at that time, the head of marketing um, and the chief medical officer just took a risk and agreed with me. And I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do it for free. I have medical debt. I have to pay a nanny to take care of my kids. And um, we worked out a, a kind of an experiment where I wrote a purpose and goals document that was based on the mission of the hospital and said, this is how I want to apply the tools of social media to the mission of the organization to translate health and science and create relatability to this data. And it, and it worked. <laughs> That's just amazing in terms of what stimulated your journey and uh, got you where you are. Uh, so who generally encompasses your audience, you would say? You know, it depends on what channel. So, you know, when I originally started writing Mama Doc back in 2009, you know, we I think in the beginning, it was a very hearty mix of clinicians and kind of local moms and dads. I mean, it, it had a very Pacific Northwest regionality until I wrote an article about rear facing car seats. So data was changing around. At the time, we turned kids around in car seats when they were one year of age, and there was very clear data, for example, that keeping a child rear facing until the age of two reduced injury by about 75% to those children between the age of one and two. And I wrote a blog post called Two is the New One, <laughs> 
it was just about before even the Academy of Pediatrics had changed it, you know, it, it, it allowed me to get the kind of word out 15 months before, but it went pretty viral. It got covered on baby center and all these other different forums. And we got a ton of attention. And after that, the audience really, I think shifted to a kind of majority of parents and families in the blog and, and physicians as well. But then I started using Twitter and then I started using Facebook and then I started using LinkedIn and Doximity and Instagram. And each one of those channels, I, I'd say, had, had a pretty specific dif different bend. And I could, you know, ultimately I could use Google, Google Analytics to determine that, but I could also really feel it in what were the comments and questions, who would I hear about it anecdotally, who would contact me with, con with you know, contact information. So I ultimately tried to start using each tool with a different agenda in some ways. With regards to, so we've uh, recognized what your mission has been, what would you say your vision would be present and moving forward with regards to HCPs in terms of how they engage and use social and media? My personal mission is to build businesses and prevention that are profitable and sustainable and ultimately change how we provide care at large. That comes from a vaccine space that comes currently in my work in working to prevent and protect against food allergies, but recognizing that, of course, the ills in some ways is that we spent all of our time and attention in, in taking care of ill and we haven't built prevention in, 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 in a hearty way. Um, but a vision, understandably, for HCPs uh, at, you know, at large, I think includes the ability and opportunity to use digital tools um, to scale their ideas, to take care of populations in narrow and broadcast, and to have it be effortless, playful when appropriate, and also trustworthy and credibility. And that, you know, like everything, you know, we spent, we, we, we so errantly created the triple aim that we went to the quadruple aim because we recognized and realized that healthcare providers and their experience were relevant to outcomes. And as we embody that, you know, what we want is in some ways, not just electronic health records that, that, that do a good job documenting care, that do a good job creating smart, efficient billing codes, but also simultaneously do a really good job capturing the intelligence, the credibility, and the knowledge of individual clinicians and distribute that knowledge to the scale that is appropriate in the time. And what I mean by that is that not just asking clinicians to go and use, you know, publicly traded companies like Facebook or Twitter, um, and now even Doximity for that matter, but to really think heartily that the lessons of, of that kind of relevance and scale um, to be applied into the tools that physicians and clinicians are using on a daily basis. So, you know, I, I've been like kind of lately, I, I need to go and meet with her again, but I, I had the opportunity to meet a few different times with Judy Faulkner when I was considering moving to Madison, which is where I live now. And I said, mm -hmm. I really want to help socialize the electronic medical record. And, and what I meant is that I want a physician to be able to log in today and say, okay, here I am in my chart. Here I am in Epic. Here I am seeing 24 patients today. How can I reach the rest of my 2000 patients, for example, that are in the panel? If I've got something novel to say, if Eric Topol tweets out a really relevant point like he did this morning on Omicron and receptors, and I wanna translate that to have my patient population understand where we are with Omicron today, where we are with Delta. I'm currently in the in the middle Northwest, we are middle Midwest. We have a huge surge in Minnesota and in and in Wisconsin. How could I take care of that population by creating a 30 second audio file by creating a one minute video where I explain it and distributing it to people who had opted into that and or distributing relevant health information by segment. So if I wanted to manage an overweight part of my population an under vaccinated part of my population, the diabetic arm in my population, right, or children with eczema, whatever it may be, I should be able to filter based on diagnostic codes, narrow cast efficiently to that and save time then when I'm with those patients and families. So that's kind of the vision that I see in the next decade or two, that we will do a better job with misinformation online, with the inability for our patients and families to get to us in ways that they want, and to disseminate information that values clinician time. I shouldn't have to explain the benefits of the flu shot 24 times a day with families. I could do it once, right? It could go into everybody's my chart or everybody's patient portal. And then I could say when they walk in the room, hey, did, was there anything you didn't understand about what I explained? And then answer relevant questions that are guided really from kind of the patient's vision themselves of what's important. No, that's a great point. Uh, thank you so much for sharing and expanding around that in terms of uh, the cohesive message and the immediacy to be able to have that outreach with patients at large uh, and peer and presumably peers also uh, other uh, fellow physicians that are shared. Uh, how would you describe your openness 
or lack of, if possible, uh, towards uh, pharma and life sciences in terms of partners, communications, and uh, just in general uh, with HCPs uh, working, especially with the new digital ways of working and how things are, how uh, the boogeyman COVID is out of the closet, basically. And there's just this whole new ecosystem, seemingly, you know, how to ga engage HCP. So I'm kind of curious of your take on previously and how it is now and what could be improved upon with some of these partnerships. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. It's a nice question. I mean, I think like all of us, we, yeah. we go through a journey in some ways um, of how we do our work and how we accomplish our, our personal, a personal purpose. Um, you know, I've had incredible mentors over the years. And one time after I gave a keynote, I, I had this <laughs> incredible um, physician, you know, pull me aside and say, you've got one, you, you know, you have to, you have to work on one problem over the course of a, a long period of time. And it may take you a decade to figure out what problem you want to solve. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, the bottom line is that when I started in this journey as a medical student and a student of bioethics, right, it, it was, it was we, we train our, our medical students and residents that industry, in some ways, the bad guy, right, that pharmaceutical manufacturers, right, are to be distrusted. We're not supposed to take pens because they work. We're not supposed to go to dinners. We're not supposed to take honoraria, et cetera. And there's great sense to that. Conflict is relevant and true. But of anything I've learned working in, you know, a um, private practice for 12 years with an academic organization for over for 15 years and now in the for-profit startup side and in partnerships with, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics or I'm a spokesperson or the CDC and government at large and departments of health across the U.S. is that everybody has a conflict. Everybody's looking for a market. Everybody's trying to solve their own problem and they're trying to keep the lights on. And what, to your question specifically, I believe the pandemic has ushered in is that, you know, Pfizer and Moderna and BioNTech, those have become household names with consumers. That, and I mean consumers specifically. They've also become household names with patients and families and those who care for and take care of others and caregivers at large. And, and what's relevant about that is that, you know, we cannot solve problems in the ivory tower or in the private practices alone. We are dependent on research coming forward with clear guidelines, governmental support and information share. And then we are deeply dependent on industry to scale novel solutions. So the journey, right, even of the story, right, of part of the scientific discoveries and mRNA vaccines at large was from an academic denied tenure who moved over to Moderna. And then her work came to the world at scale because she worked for a pharmaceutical company is a gorgeous pinhole of light right onto the opportunities of how we judiciously take our Hippocratic Oath and apply that with the levers of industry in smart ways. I currently work for a venture-backed startup. We're partnered with Nestle Health Sciences for a global launch of products around the world. It's no problem for me. I am conflicted because I'm a stockholder and shareholder. I believe that using this lever will change the way that babies eat allergens in early life all over the world. And I know that this is one good stop in my career to learn of how the money Money moves around to learn at how we scale and understand this. And so, you know, I used to think that, you know, even with my ethics training, I talked to young clinicians or medical students and it's kind of like, yeah, you can't take conflict. And now it's like, the answer maybe isn't no, but yes, but right. Yes. I want to help work with you, but under these personal criteria that make sure that I keep in check, for example, you know, when I've done vaccine education and standards, if I were to ever receive honorarium, I would donate that because I never wanted anyone in that place of misinformation and distrust around vaccines to think that I was recommending or even translating information about vaccine science and safety because I was going to ever personally gain from it. I just never wanted that to be at play when, you know, 10% of my content at Mama Doc over the 10 years was specifically written about increasing and building trust in vaccine science and safety. And this was well before the infodemic and the pandemic misinformation trust and rise. So we have to think really carefully of what is our role and how do we do that? But right now as the chief medical officer in front of a company and facing a company, it is a conflict that I'm taking and I'm doing it heartily so that I can more quickly collapse the bench to bedside translational piece, which is we know it takes 17 years for new information. I know that parents and families distrust eating allergens in early life. And I know I could go about working on nonprofit or I could use this for-profit organization to get into more households and help families and pediatricians understand the science. Really appreciate the candidness there along uh, working with pharma life science in terms of the misinformation out there and just stances sometimes uh, positions that HCPs need to take. So uh, finally, what's next for you? What's new and exciting? Yeah, thanks. I 
Um, well, I'm about to join uh, Stanford University and work in um, the Department of Medicine in some digital health projects. I'm really looking forward to returning in part to, to academics in that way. Um, in addition, you know, I, I think increasingly, you know, as we work um, at, at Spoonful One, you know, at helping understand um, how we pretend to protect and prevent, you know, my goal, I think, is to continue to, to stand in front of companies um, that are deeply dedicated to disruption. Uh, you know, I've really enjoyed being a part of this startup and trying to disrupt both how pediatricians um, talk with families and, and how basically Target and Walmart, you know, lock their shelves with the right foods. I, you know, I was talking to a head merchant at, at, at Walmart this morning, who's the father of a four month old. And I thought, you know, you, you're at Walmart. If you put allergens into baby foods, the next generation of children will have less allergies. And, and we, we know that the data is, is resoundingly clear. So my goal is to, you know, I think I learned when I, when I left Seattle Children's, I'd written that blog for 10 years. I wrote over 800 blog posts, did like thousands of YouTubes, did all this content. And then I have this, you know, I have my own blog sitting on a website. It's just my name, wendysueswanson.com. And, and I've left it dormant. For me, I, I recognize and realize that it's really important to me to be voicing and facing a larger mission with a much larger sense of purpose than being an individual myself. So, you know, as time moves forward, I'll be hopefully continuing to work on building businesses and prevention and, and facing and providing, you know, keynotes and health translation to um, the urgency and impatience that we should all have at building the future of our practice of medicine and our receiving of medical care in the way that we want that uses and leverages digital more and more so that our time together in real life uh, is that much better. This has been great. These insights that you've shared around the use of digital and social to reach wider and greater communities, also enhancing health experiences now and in the future towards improving outcomes. Thank you uh, for your time, Dr. Swanson. Thanks so much. For more information about the emerging HCP digital opinion leaders and influencers, please feel free to contact me at umar at liveworld.com.